What I'm doing down here this afternoon is checking into some bottles for a tasting coming up of the Pinot Noir grape. And there'll be wines from California, which I have here, wines from Oregon over here, and around the corner are some wines from France made from that grape. And I'm going to try to put together a really special and kind of historic tasting from some bottles from the cellar. For instance, an early Pinot Noir from California that I think would be a lot of fun to taste is this bottle, which is really quite historic, 1969 Hanzel Pinot Noir. Hanzel was the first winery in California to start using small oak cooperage in the making of Pinot Noir. So there's a lot of history attached to that bottle. More recently, a very famous winery is Williams and Selium. And so there'll probably be a bottle of Williams and Selium from the California selection. And here's a bottle of Kistler Pinot Noir from the Hirsch Vineyard. Kistler makes gorgeous Pinot Noir. So it's likely that those three wineries will be re represented. I don't say that those are necessarily the three best, but they all have a special kind of history and cachet right now. When we go to Oregon, the Oregon wines, I probably would want to include a wine from Rex Hill, which makes really fine Pinot Noir. Here's a wine made from Sine Qua Non, actually a, San, a, a California winery, but they get grapes from Oregon almost every year and make a wine. Manfred Kronkel is the winemaker. These wines are really in a class by themselves. And maybe might include this wine from St. Innocent. Those are wonderful, wonderful Pinot Noirs from Oregon. Come around the corner and I'll show you some of the Burgundies I might choose. Burgundy was, of course, the birthplace of Pinot Noir. And certainly I will want to include a wine from the Dr. Barillet collection, which to me are the most exciting wines from Burgundy I've ever tasted. This bottle is so old, the label has fallen off. I think it's probably hiding up here. Let me see if I can find another bottle that has a Barillet label on it to show you. Yeah, this one does. It's been a little eaten by slugs over the years. But this is a 1950 Nuit Saint-Georges from Dr. Barillet, a superb, superb bottle. So I'm going to include one of these old Barillets in the tasting, and then maybe a Richebourg from the domain of Jean Gros, 1969, which was an extraordinary year. It was Josephine and my anniversary year. So we bought a lot of 69 Burgundies, which have been wonderful. You know, it's really hard to, to have a per particular favorite wine in a whole world full of wine possibilities, although I gravitate towards, towards some in, in each group, like in the German wines, even though I, I love so many of them, I tend to gravitate towards wines made from the Mosul area that have the green bottle, as opposed to the wines from the Rheingau, which have the brown bottle. I love them both, but I'd say I sort of tilt towards the mosul saar Ruver area. And, uh, you know, looking at California Chardonnays, I'm, I'm just terribly fond of Kistler Chardonnays. That They're just marvelous. I see another bottle here. This is Peter Michael, makes wonderful Chardonnay. This Cuvée en Dijon is a wonderful, wonderful bottle. And uh, the Talbot wines I historically have liked a lot. They're Chardonnays. Here's a Here's a bottle of Talbot, which is, uh, that's a wonderful Chardonnay. And well, looking at some of these other areas, here's a, here's a rack full of, of Cabernet Sauvignons. Uh, historically, when we first started to collect BV, Beaulieu made the greatest California Cabernets, and they're still among the most historic ones made. But since then, there's a whole plethora of marvelous uh, California Cabernet wines. I'm, I'm particularly fond of Pride. I think these Pride mountain-grown uh, uh, Napa Valley cabs are spectacular wines. Uh, among the, the most pricey ones, uh, Harlem is a, an amazing cult Cabernet, which I think is really worth its reputation. Here's a small winery, Barons and Hitchcock, that makes a kind of 
uh, artisan's garage wine. I mean, it's they're totally dedicated to quality, and they do very unusual things. And it's just fun that you can d discover more and more things. Here's a here's a, another Barons and Hitchcock wine called Ode to Picasso. <laughs> this, they're into their own trip. It's great. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Here's champagnes. I'm a big fan of champagne. Uh, I love Dom Perignon, but there are others I like as much or even more. Krug is a great favorite of mine. Here's a, here's a Dom Perignon from 82, which is a, a treasure of a champagne. And I think I have a, here's an old Krug, 1966 Krug. This is just spectacular champagne. A lot of people think champagne doesn't age. But properly stored champagne ages beautifully and just becomes more and more rich and complex with time. Here's an old Sauterne, Chateau Soudreau. It's from 1962, one of the great all-time years for Sauterne. And you can see how deep amber colors it gets. Over time, Sauterne gets darker and darker. Uh, and if it's a great bottle from a great year, they can age for decades and decades and decades. This whole rack is older Bordeaux wine, and there are some real treasures here. I mean, for instance, here's a bottle of 66 Chateau Latour, which, believe it or not, is just beginning to come into its own. It's taken that long for this great first growth Bordeaux to really start showing its colors. And that's very exciting to see. Then looking up here, here's something quite, quite special. Chateau Ponte Canet from the 1945 vintage in Magnum. 45 for most people is like the top three or four vintages of the 20th century, along with 29 and 61. And this wine should still be drinking beautifully. Saving that for a special occasion. Josephine was hoping to drink this at a special dinner one of these days and that's what we're gonna gonna do. Here's something quite amazing. Chateau Lafitte 1908. I discovered this wine, cases of this wine, when I was a medical student at Johns Hopkins. I was visiting one of my medical student buddies who was staying at an old mansion in Baltimore, down in the basement, and we were, he's a drummer, and we were playing some music, and he said, hey, you know, there's some amazing wine, I don't know, it's probably all spoiled, uh, in this cellar here, well, take a look. So I looked and I, I saw there were unopened cases of this wine. And I said, wow, man, this wine could be really very valuable, and she said, well, why don't you talk to the the lady of the house, she was a widow of one of the first uh, professors of medicine at Johns Hopkins. And I talked to her, I said, you know, there's wine down there that looks extremely valuable. Don't you want to do something with it? And she said, you know, you'd be doing me a favor if you just get that wine off my hands. I told her, it may be worth a lot of money. Said, I don't care. It's just taking up space. Why don't you just take it? So I did. And I shipped it back to Chicago. And most of the bottles were not good. The corks had rotted over time. But it turned out that there were probably a couple of cases of this wine that were supernaturally gorgeous and remain in my memory as some of the best wine experiences I've ever had.